Did you know that there's water under the ground that we can use as drinking water? Let's talk about it. Hi everyone, welcome to episode 4 of The Science Behind. It's me, Guy, and we're today to talk about groundwater. And I'm with Paul Spate. Hi Paul. Hi Guy. Yeah, I'm Paul Spate. Um, I'm one of the company's hydrogeologists. And uh, we're going to talk about groundwater today. So we're going to be having a look to start off with it, uh, the Victorian pumping station behind us. Excellent. Shall we go have a look? Yep, yeah, let's do it. Cool. Well, we're now inside the, uh, the old pumping station and what we're looking at here is a, 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 what would have been a steam-powered triple expansion pump. Um, and uh, what we can see above us, which is like, it's a, it's a, a very big machine. Uh, we're only actually looking at about half of it. There's a, a very deep basement beneath us and uh, the other half of the, of the pump would have been down there. And uh, back in the days where this was operational, there would have been two others, so there's three of these in here. Lots of noise, lots of steam, lots of smoky smells, loads of people working here. It would have been a very different environment to what we see today. This pump would have been uh, in continuous use from when it was installed in the 1930s right up until the 1970s, um, when it would be replaced by uh, newer technology using electric pumps, uh, much, much the same as the ones we, we have now. So Paul, what is groundwater and why do we use it? Simply put, uh, groundwater is any water in the ground. And um, I suppose it's not, it's not that surprising that you know, by the time you get below the soil and the, um, the, the, the sort of recent deposits, as we would call them, but when I say recent, we're talking something in the last sort of million years or so, um, down into the solid rocks, then there's, there's a bit of water down there. What's perhaps more surprising is just how much of it there is. Um, the vast majority of the world's water resources are groundwater and some estimates put um, groundwater is making up in excess of 95% of all the liquid fresh water on the planet. So all, if you think of all the reservoirs and the rivers and the lakes put together, that makes up less than 5% of the fresh water that's liquid on, on the planet. In Yorkshire, uh, we kind of, uh, it makes up about a fifth of the, our total abstraction. And the reason for that is because we've got lots of uh, reservoirs over in the, the west of the region and they were kind of mostly built to supply the industrial towns of western South Yorkshire. But over in the east where we are now, um, we use groundwater. And um, part of the reason for that is because it's very flat, there aren't any big valleys that we can, we can flood using dams uh, to build reservoirs. But also, you've got very productive aquifers here with lots and lots of water in them. Put in a historical context, the um, groundwater has been used for a really long time, uh, long before we had reservoirs or anything like that. Um, people would get their water supply typically from the village well or the, the village pump. And the reason they did that was because um, rivers and ponds and lakes tend to be full of dirty water, which do, will do you no good at all. Whereas groundwater is naturally clean because it sort of filters down through the, 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 the rocks and it's in the ground for long enough that uh, by the time you, get, you, you pull it out of the ground, it doesn't really need very much treatment, so, so you, can, you can drink it pretty much straight away. We wouldn't do that now because there are rules against it, but that's how it was done. So, we've moved on to another site. Um, Paul, um, what are we up to now? Yeah, yeah, we've, mo we've moved. We're a few miles further north now. Um, we were around um, Hull before, uh, on the East Yorkshire Chalk. We're still on the Chalk, but um, it's a different landscape around here. Um, the, the, it's much more hilly because we're up on the, the higher ground, um, up on the chalk walls. Excellent, so go have a look around the site? Yeah, let's do that. Cool. So Paul, what's the difference between sandstones and limestones? A sandstone aquifer is made up of lots of grains of sand, as you might expect. And um, the water sits in between the grains and it flows in between them. If you imagine you had a bucket of sand and you poured some water in, the water would disappear into the sand. And if you drilled a hole in the bottom, the water would drip out of the hole. And the same thing happens in a, a sandstone aquifer. The water moves between the sand grains. Obviously the sand is not sand, it's sandstone, so it's, they're cemented together, but there's enough space for the water to get through. It only moves slowly, 
but there's a lot of water stored in there so, so you can have a, a slow moving large quantity of water moving through. Quite different to that is when we think about um, limestone aquifers and we're on the, the East Yorkshire Chalk at the moment and chalk is a kind of limestone. Um, the, the water sits in uh, cracks and bedding planes and, and gaps in the rock because the, um, whilst there is some space in between the grains, the grains are so tiny and the spaces are so tiny that the water can't move through it very easily. So the water tends to move along these cracks and fissures. Um, and in the limestone, because limestones are ever so slightly soluble in rainwater, those cracks and fissures start off as a little hairline crack in the rock and over time they, they get bigger mm. so the water can move through. So what you tend to get, you've got less water stored in the rock but it can move through much faster. So we said that there's a borehole on this site, whereabouts is it? It's here. Oh wow! Yeah, this is this is a, a borehole. A borehole is a, a vertical shaft drilled into the into the ground, um, and this one is uh, about seventy five meters deep, which is typical depth for boreholes into this aquifer. Um, and when you when you're drilling a borehole, um, there's three things you really have to 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 get right. I mean, there's lots of things you have to consider. Um, but the first thing is 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 the borehole in the right location? Um, and to do that, uh, or to help with that, we would go to the geological maps um, so that we can look at the, the, what's the geology in this area. The, the second thing you need to, to consider is how deep the borehole is going to be. Um, if you look at a textbook on these things, it will tell you the ideal borehole goes right to the bottom of the aquifer. In reality, you rarely want to do that for a drinking water supply. And the reason for that is that you, you tend to get what we call conate groundwaters hanging around at the bottom of the aquifer and they're, they're very concentrated mineral waters. They've been around for a very, very long time and they don't go anywhere and they've dissolved lots of minerals out of the rocks. And they, they, the last thing you want is to get those in your drinking water supply. So you'll terminate the borehole depth um, safely above that, that sort of a depth in the aquifer. And the third thing you have to consider is the depth of the casing. And by casing, what we mean is when you drill a borehole, you will normally um, seal the top 10, 20, 30 meters of it um, with a, a steel tube, and that's sealed against the, the rocks. And the reason it's there is to prevent dirty water from the surface getting into the borehole, because um, the, the water at the surface is it's percolating down through the soil. It carries with it lots of bacteria from the soil and things that come out of the back end of animals and that sort of thing. Um, they get entrained in that water, but those sorts of bacterial species don't tend to last very long. It's a very hostile environment in the ground for them, and so they tend to die off. So by the time the water gets down to what we call the response zone, which is the bit between the bottom of the borehole and the, the, the bottom of the casing, all those bacteria have died. So if you, if you like, there's, there's kind of what you might call a sort of Goldilocks zone in, in the aquifer, which is where you're going to get the, the clean, wholesome water that, that we're looking for, and that's the bit that we target. Okay, so we're looking at the borehole now, um, and the, the, the bit at the bottom, that is the top of the casing that we were talking about, so that extends about 20 metres into the ground. This borehole's got two pumps in it, and that's quite common in this area because um, in the olden days, this borehole would have just been, uh, the, the water would have been treated on site and, and distributed to the local area. And so if one of the pumps broke down, you always had a backup. So, that's groundwater then? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, thank you for, for, for coming along and allowing me to, to show you a little bit about what we do with groundwater and uh, give you a bit of an introduction. Uh, to the sorts of assets that we use. Yeah, thanks Paul. Yeah, no, it's been really good. Like, I've seen the, the way they do it in sort of West Yorkshire and with the reservoirs and all that, so it's good to come over to the east and see how we do it here. Yeah, things are a bit different out here. Yeah, just a little bit, uh, but no, it's been really good. So, yeah, I'll see you again soon. Yep, thanks, Guy. All right, cheers, Paul. See, see you bye later. Bye. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed that episode all about groundwater. It's really good of Paul to let me follow him around for the day and see what goes down over in Hull. Um, if you've got any questions, let us know in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell your mates. And in the next episode, I'll be going to a water treatment works to find out, well, how they treat water. 
See you then.